Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, Joint Bioengineering Seminar Series. Uh, today, uh, today, we are hosting Dr. Ben Schultz. He has expertise in the design, processing, testing, and characterization of high-performance and lightweight hybrid and composite materials. These include metal alloys, composite materials, forms, nanocomposites, self-lubricating, and other tribo biomaterials biomaterials and materials for additive manufacturing. He has published over 40 peer-reviewed articles on the topic of advanced materials and manufacturing, and he has presented his work to a broad audience, including conference at attendees, industry professionals, students ranging in preparation from elementary to graduate school. His current research is on bioresorbable magnesium alloy form biomaterials produced using additive manufacturing and casting processes. Uh, his today topic is design and synthesis of metal forms for structural and biomedical applications. Please join me welcoming Dr. Schultz. Thank you. Thank you for that in introduction. Um, well, uh, I'm going to try to breeze through my presentation a little faster so that I uh, give people time to, uh, to get back to where they need to go. And thank you for coming this afternoon. Uh, my alarm's going to go off at a point where it's supposed to be five minutes of questions. So uh, that's on purpose. Uh, so I'm going to talk um, about some of my past research on uh, metal foams and syntactic foams. And uh, it's going to be, uh, the presentation is a little bit heavier on the structural side uh, than the biomedical side. Um, because the biomedical side for me is pretty new. I'm getting into this area. Uh, and the, uh, the reason I'm starting with the structural side as well is to give you some idea of how these materials could be designed to mimic some of the properties of uh, biomaterials such as like, a, like bone. Um, so uh, to give you that background, I'm just going to get into this. Has anybody taken a course or are familiar with composite materials in this, this room? Well, composite materials are combinations of uh, a, uh, at least two materials. One is a matrix that surrounds the material, and then there's a, another phase that we call reinforcement, and that could be in the form of fibers. There's fiber reinforced composites everywhere now for reducing weight and um, a lot of applications. Uh, they can also be particulate. So this is a picture of a metal matrix composite that is a commercial alloy used for things like brake rotors. Uh, and uh, these little dark specks are silicon carbide particles, and this is an aluminum silicon alloy. Um, <clears throat> and there are a variety of ways of manufacturing these composites. And uh, from a material science perspective, we know that uh, depending on how you process something, you're going to be able to uh, uh, affect its structure and affect its properties as well. So there's a relationship between the, the process, the structure of the, the material, the microstructure, and its properties. There's also a, uh, a cost element of it as well. Uh, this is the various ways that we can make a material like this. We can use uh, diffusion processes that uh, require kind of expensive equipment and time. We have powder metallurgy processes where we combine powdered metals and the silicon carbide particles, mix them up, compress them, and sinter them. And then we have liquid metal processes where we take, these, uh, take this metal, we melt it, we add the silicon carbide some way, and then we cast it into a shape. And it turns out that you know, these are going to be the most expensive, and these are going to be the least expensive. And that's why, you know, kind of traditionally, we, we, we focused, in, at this, at least at UWM, on these, light, uh, on these liquid metal processes because they're uh, lower cost. Um, so just a, a really quick uh, you know, overview of some applications of these things. I've worked a lot with metal matrix composites like this, the picture you saw previously. These are some examples, brake drums, uh, brake rotors, drive shafts, and they all uh, offer opportunities to reduce weight. You could potentially replace the steel component with something that's about half the weight and save a lot on, uh, on energy. We've, uh, my dissertation was on uh, metal matrix nanocomposites and the, uh, the promise with these materials, rather than using micro size reinforcements like I showed in the previous slide, I'm using nano size reinforcements uh, that can reduce the grain size and also strengthen the material through processes uh, 
that we um, describe as Orowan strengthening. Um, and these could, uh, if you were able to get a composite where you have uh, about 17 volume percent of a 10 nanometer sized particle fully dispersed into the composite, we could get a, a one gigapascal strengthened aluminum, which is stronger than any aluminum and rivaling steel. Um, we also have unique properties that are not just strength, but also uh, lubrication proper properties. This is a uh, aluminum composite with graphite particles. So we can um, add graphite to the aluminum and uh, make it self-lubricating, reduces friction coefficient. Uh, there are a lot of tribological uh, problems in the body, in the joints, um, when you have a joint replacement, uh, if you're using a metal component that is rubbing against the metal component, that will lead to some wear debris, and that wear debris can be toxic and cause the, the, the implant to fail. So looking at unique ways, creative ways of making those metal components not wear as quickly or not uh, leave toxic debris inside the body, uh, metal matrix composites might be a way of, uh, of attacking that problem. Thermal applications, heat sinks, done a lot of work uh, on uh, things like aluminum cubic boron nitride um, that have very high thermal conductivities that uh, can be used for uh, things like heat sinks and electronic components. Uh, and uh, the topic of today's talk is about uh, metal, metallic foams and metal matrix syntactic foams. These are kind of an interesting class of material, and I've got some handouts I'll pass around here. Um, these are very porous metals. Uh, the porosity can be greater than 90% um, in some cases. Uh, metal foams are just, the porosity is just a, a hole. Sometimes they can be closed so that each, each hole is separate from each other. And uh, in this case, this is an open cell porosity. So uh, if you can almost, you can see through this if you hold it up to the light. Uh, these are extremely light materials. And I'm gonna pass this around and be careful when holding onto this because it's, it, don't grab it hard because it's, it has some little sharp edges on it if you really squeeze on it. Um, so that, that type of material has been used for things like energy absorbers. And uh, my current research, I'm, I'm exploring these types of materials for um, uh, bone scaffolds um, that I'll talk about a little later. The uh, syntactic foams are a type of composite foam. So instead of having just pores, we have hollow particles creating the porosity. And this is a um, this is aluminum. This is A206, which is an aluminum copper alloy, high strength alloy. This has um, aluminum oxide hollow spheres in it. And if you look very closely at this when I pass this around, you can see these little, look like little pinholes, those are the spheres that have been cut in half. So on that surface, you're seeing the holes that are inside those spheres. So I'll pass this around too. So these have all kinds of applications uh, for energy absorption and also uh, reducing the weight. We've made some lead uh, syntactic phones, for example, that are half the density of lead. Uh, so you could save weight in lead acid batteries. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they, has some really unique behavior when you, you look at the mechanical deformation. Um, metal foams, what they typically do, if you were to crush that metal foam that I'm passing around, if you were to plot that on a, uh, are you familiar with stress strain curves? You've taken the uh, engineering courses, introductory engineering courses. Metal foams, when you, cr when you crush them, they do something like this. So they will start to deform elastically. And then once they start to yield, rather than continuing to go up like most metals do, does anybody know what this is called? This portion of it? It's the reason why it goes up when it's plastic, plastic deformation. And the, it goes up because it's strain hardening. So it's getting harder and harder as you're, as you're crushing it. Metal foams don't do that, they plateau, right? And that's because all those little pores are crushing, right? 
and uh, eventually it starts to go up just like the metal because it's fully densified. Syntactic foams behave similarly, except they have a little dip here, and then they have some, some, uh, some things that sometimes go on here where they start to uh, shear and then crush and then shear and then crush and shear and crush until they finally densify. So uh, the analysis that you'll see um, is based on that. Now this is a uh, Ashby chart. This is showing the, the relative properties of various foam materials. And this is a specific energy absorption, which is the area under this curve divided by the density. And then the specific peak strength, which is this value, like the yield strength, divided by the density. And uh, this is a way of comparing things by weight. Uh, this is a metal foam, so for when I passed out earlier, and these are the syntactic foams. So they are capable of absorbing more energy than the metal foams are and uh, at uh, reduced weights or, uh, or more, more energy and higher peak strengths. Some of our composites uh, are up here. Uh, these stars are some of our uh, foams that we've created in the lab. So lots of processes for making these. Uh, we focus on these liquid metal processes, and I'm just going to skip these slides because we'll get into the, the inter more data stuff. So how can we design better composites? One of the ways is, of course, going to be selecting high quality materials to go into those composites. Another way is to look at things like the uh, structure of these spheres and uh, control the thickness to and the diameter of the sphere. So the thickness of the wall and the diameter of the sphere. If you plot the um, peak strength versus the T by D ratio, which is the thickness by diameter ratio, we get some plots that look like this, where as you uh, increase the T by D ratio, your peak strength goes up. Uh, also, as you uh, increase the strength of the alloy that you're working with, your peak strength bumps up. Same thing for magnesium alloys. It has that relation, increasing T by D, increasing peak strength, and uh, increasing alloy strength. You have increasing peak strength. We did some work to evaluate this. We looked at the T by D ratio uh, of these spheres. These are some of the foams that we created uh, with various sizes of the spheres. Um, <coughs> size ranges. And these are the uh, compression curves and we can see that there's an initial peak and then it drops off and then you have some densification events happening here that cause it to uh, eventually crush and densify the composite. Let's see if this, actually I do have a little video, I forgot about that one. This is showing how that cr crushes, right, as this material is compressed. And as you see this, it, see how it shears on these angles, right? This is very common uh, shear behavior in metals. Uh, but what's a little bit uncommon with these foams is that they not only shear in this manner, but they shear and uh, fracture these, um, these, these spheres to densify the material. <clears throat> so this is some S, uh, optical images and SEM images, scanning electron microscope images of the uh, spheres that have sheared and started to fracture within the uh, metal. And you can see this is a cross section. Uh, regions in these bands that are oriented at those 45 degree angles, as you saw in the, in the little video, these images are showing within these bands, the spheres are crushed in their sheared in relation to each other. So they're no longer, they're not crushed in place, but they're, they're actually physically sheared. Uh, other properties that are important, like the toughness, that's looking at the energy absorption. Um, we see um, uh, effects on the, uh, of the T by D ratio. As T by D ratio increases, we have increasing properties across the board. This is toughness. Um, size ranges of the spheres give you uh, better uh, 
specific energy absorption with increasing uh, sphere content. We've also looked at high strain rate properties of these materials. Uh, high strain rate is uh, most of these tests that we've been doing are quasi-static tests. They're very, very slow, and that's what most of your engineering data is based on, what you're looking up in the handbook. High strain rate data uh, is done using specialized equipment uh, to look at how something would behave under a kind of a drastic load or a blast or uh, even something shot at it. Um, so this is a split Hopkinson bar test. We have a transmitter bar with some, and an incident bar with strain gauges attached. Our specimen goes between these two and then a striker bar uh, hits this incident bar, smashes the specimen and we can get a, a relatively high strain rate measurement of the uh, deformation of that material. And uh, our material uh, under these conditions, it was only around 1,000 per second strain rate compared to 10 to the minus 3. Uh, you see a lot of scatter there, but it's more or less constant. At even higher strain rates, something that you'd see in a blast event, thousands of pe uh, thousands per second, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. You might start seeing some strain rate dependence, but we don't see it. We've also done the same work with magnesium. It can be done with magnesium um, and uh, had similar results with that material. Uh, I already mentioned the effect of matrix properties. Um, so this is three different Compositions and three different treatments, heat treatments, the ASCAS, T4, and T7 are different solutionizing heat treatments and uh, aging heat treatments. And we see increased mechanical properties with the um, heat, -treated prop heat treated composites compared to the um, ASCAS composites. I'm just going to kind of skip through this. Okay. Um, other reinforcement materials, silicon carbide, as opposed to aluminum oxide, you can get even uh, you can get uh, tailored properties based on not only the properties of the matrix, the size of the reinforcement, the thickness of the walls. You can get different properties by changing the reinforcement itself. So these are uh, some some data that we found for or we uh, measured for. Uh, A206, which is an aluminum alloy, AZ91, which is a magnesium alloy with uh, two different uh, reinforcements. High strain rate properties also reveal the same kind of shearing. As you see, this is a, a big crack within this and some shearing of the spheres. Um, and uh, similar properties compared to the uh, quasi-static results. Um, taking this data, uh, we looked at what analytical, analytical models were out there uh, for um, evaluating the, the properties based on things that we can change, like the matrix properties, the reinforcement properties, the, the size and thick, uh, thickness of the walls, and uh, try to apply them to our, our data and the, the plots that we're getting from the various, um, various models that are out there were very far from the uh, experimental results. So this, along this red line, this would be a one-to-one -one, uh, match between the empirical models and the, uh, or the, the models and the empirical data. And uh, what we're getting is far off from that. So we took several parameters, and these are the parameters that we evaluated, and uh, developed some models that uh, fit rather well with the uh, experimental results. Um, looking at some properties, how we define them, it's less important than, you know, it's just showing that we, we've got some relationships based on uh, these parameters uh, that, that are measurable from uh, doing microscopy and from um, uh, doing some initial, initial testing. We can get a, uh, a very close relationship between uh, experimental and the empirical uh, calculation. Okay. This is toughness predicted versus experimental. Density is a little harder to evaluate because of defects that are present within these, these spheres and 
uh, between the uh, within the composites, but that is also measurable. Um, now, looking at some applications of this, uh, when I d did this work, I was looking at it for things like blast resistance and crushing absorption. There was kind of a theme there. Uh, so we did some evaluation based on what a, how it would resist a blast, how it would behave in a blast. And a metal foam versus a syntactic foam, if you were to create like a barrier, a uh, metal foam could withstand this 100 kilograms of TNT at two meters if it's 87 inches thick and weighed over 1,000 pounds. The same amount of energy can be absorbed by um, uh, for the same amount of uh, TNT and all the same situation, about five sixteenths of an inch of syntactic foam at around a little less than half the weight. So there, this is a calculation, not an actual measurement, but it gives some idea of some of the promise of that, and why we look at things like like composites, um, and uh, these could be used for things like uh, energy absorbers and uh, you know, to uh, protect against under, under vehicle blasts. So I've, so far I've talked about, and I'm gonna rush through, uh, the um, work that I've done on uh, syntactic foams that uh, are looking at design for the mechanical properties. But there are a lot of interesting future prospects uh, with related to um, implants. Uh, one researcher that I've got here produced titanium ceramic microsphere uh, composites by powder metallurgy processes to try to match the stiffness and flexural strength of cancellous bone. If you insert, and you all know this more better, better than I do, uh, if, if you insert a uh, um, implant that is has a difference in mechanical properties from the uh, the bone that it's going into, it can lead to some damage because this is going to de deform differently than the surrounding material. So you're putting pressure or uh, uh, in tension or compression, depending on the axis on these on this uh, femur, that can lead to some some damage to that femur over time. Uh, also, this 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 titanium foam, this titanium material is is there permanently, and it uh, is uh, over time can can lead to some damages and need to be replaced. So there's some interest in creating some kind of uh, temporary fix that helps helps that uh, that bone to grow or. Uh, helps as long as it needs to be. Now this isn't a related to bones, this is a uh, bioresorbable stent material. This is a magnesium scaffold that's um, uh, dissolvable about 95% uh, over uh, a year. So within a year it is about 95% resorbed into the body. And uh, this is a commercial product that's uh, just recently introduced. Um, so these, this, this concept of putting a, a material into the body that is resorbable in the, in the case of magnesium is not entirely new. Um, <clears throat> so biomaterials that we're looking at are, are within this region. And uh, the metals that I've been talking about are kind of up here, right? They, they do, not, uh, do not match perfectly with this. We've got stainless steel is there, titanium is represented here, right? Uh, but if we can match something that's closer to your cancellous bone properties, we're in better shape. So magnesium alloys that I've been working with are, have very attractive properties. Uh, they're very lightweight, uh, but they are very difficult to cast. And uh, there are, are at this time no 3D printing methods uh, that are used to create magnesium components. Uh, so there's kind of some, some difficulties there in their processing that prevent that. Um, but magnesium foams could be ideal bone implant materials 
because they can be custom made to match not only the structures, but also the properties of, of cancellous bone. Uh, so the metal foams could, could be within this region shown with the dashed marks. So the technology, and I apologize for this kind of amateurish uh, uh, picture, but the, the technology I'm developing uh, would allow us to take some, uh, some CAD model based on even a, a, a scan of somebody's bone, take that to create a pattern which we can 3D print, and then finally cast uh, liquid magnesium into it, remove that pattern, and we have a magnesium bone scaffold. Some people have done some similar things, uh, various methods. One person has taken magnesium ribbons that you can purchase from like Sigma Aldrich and cintured them together in stacks to create uh, a structure like this. Um, this obviously has some uh, drawbacks and is not very uh, scalable. Here we have um, a researcher that took titanium wire and kind of bundled it up and then cast magnesium surrounding it and then dissolved away the titanium with hydrofluoric acid. And I'm just going to use that for a bone scaffold. There's obvious problems with that because hydrofluoric acid is extremely toxic. There is my thing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the third is uh, someone used sodium chloride uh, as a template and then tried to dissolve it away and uh, it left some corrosion and some uh, issues with matching that, that template that we want to create. So our objectives are to create kind of a scalable casting process uh, using an extrudable material that uh, can recreate structures found in bone. We did an I-Core program. I'm going to skip through this real quick. Uh, but I'll share the slides and you can take a look at them on your own time. Some interesting things here about how if you're designing something for uh, commercial purposes, you want to do some more than just a literature review, you want to talk to people and find out what they need, what are the problems. You have some ideas in your head of what the problems might be, but uh, until you talk to someone and find out do, I actually, do they actually need this product, uh, you are kind of left in the dark, right? So that was the whole purpose of these slides. And uh, I guess um, these are some of the design parameters that we're trying to hit. We're trying to match porosity, uh, the types of porosity, multi-scale porosity that might be in bone. We're trying to match pore sizes and structure, something that's highly interconnected. We're trying to mimic the properties of bone. We're also trying to control the rate at which these magnesium alloys degrade inside the body. So we're doing some alloy development with this as well. Uh, we also want this to be compatible, so we can't use anything that's toxic. Uh, and we also want this to be sterilizable, so that it, the sterilizing processes that are used don't destroy the, the material. So I'm going to stop here and let you ask some questions, because we're out of time. Um, so are there any questions? I really rushed through. <laughs> Questions? I have one. So, yep. mm -hmm. if, for example, uh, currently titanium is used for those implants, mm -hmm. uh, are we able to then? Is it possible to make uh, those magnesium scaffolds uh, surrounding those titanium implants? Because this is bioresorbable, mm -hmm. it's going to be the first interaction point for the tissue. Then it's going to inter uh, help integration better. But uh, at the backbone, we have already titanium in there. Um, so we are both using uh, titanium at the uh, at the point that it is uh, already approved in terms of its strength and durability, but mm -hmm. also using the magnesium because it's bioresorbable and because it's porous. And how about the adhesion in between? Okay. Um, okay. 
Okay, I, I, just there's, so there's several strategies that you could p potentially do that, I think. Uh, that would, that's an interesting, I, I haven't seen anybody doing that, uh, but I think it would be possible. Um, one way that uh, is done, this is actually a very um, common thing to do in the foundry industry for things, not, not for bones, but for things like uh, engines, where they will cast in a liner into the cylinder, piston cylinder liner uh, engine. Uh, using uh, kind of a mechanical interlocking between the two materials. The, the liner has some roughness that the metal surrounding it can grab onto. So if you were to develop this titanium backbone with some, some structure on the surface that you later cast the magnesium surrounding it, that can help that bond between the titanium and the magnesium. I'm not sure what the uh, reactions would be between Magnesium and titanium at the, the, the kind of temperatures that we'd be talking about, but uh, it also is possible that there might be some chemical bonding uh, that would allow that to to be done. But uh, yeah, I, I could see that uh, being a uh, a method of developing an Im implant. So. Um, curious to know more about the degradation of magnesium. That well, that is a uh, uh, that's an important problem uh, with magnesium because uh, when magnesium dissolves, it also evolves hydrogen, and that can be uh, kind of captured or, or kept within within the the the, the body surrounding the tissue surrounding that implant. So it's very important. I mentioned very, very briefly that we're doing some, some alloy development. We're trying to control that corrosion rate. Um, depending on what, uh, what alloying elements that you have there, most of the elements, most of the alloys that have been used are very, fairly pure. Uh, so they're not an alloy. Um, and uh, that is uh, going to be uh, kind of a, a, a surface degradation that can be kind of controlled by surface coatings, right? Um, there's also some concern that if uh, that magnesium part is dissolving in the body, it can lead to some sharp edges as it's, as it's dissolving away that could cause tissue damage. So these are things that we're kind of looking at of how to, how to control that corrosion rate and how it actually occurs. Um, one of the ways that uh, people try to prevent that is through kind of developing a passivating film on the surface that helps prevent that corrosion from occurring so quickly. Kind of like if you painted your car. No more questions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.